I cannot do all medications and supplements in 30 minutes. There's just no way. So I kind of picked and chose. You did get a handout. Um, that is a work in progress, and um, I have a PharmD working with me who, who's going to ex help us expand that and um, make it more uh, user-friendly, so alphabetical list with interactions and uh, side effects and uh, uses. So um, we do have a website for the TREAT program, and we'll be putting things up there. So my disclosure is that I am funded by the Lipedema Foundation for the TREAT program. And now that you have your diagnosis, what do you want, a treatment? <laughs> yes, we do. So um, here's an optimistic thought. You're not chronically ill. You're medically interesting. <laughs> this is for you, Linny. Where's Linny? This is for you. There you go. So um, I'm going to talk about how we can improve the large fat cells in lipedema and Durkheim's disease. Both disorders have these large fat cells, which we call hypertrophic adipocytes or hypertrophic fat cells. We want to improve the health of our mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy powerhouses of the cell, and they help break down fat. So we want those little suckers working. We want to ma maintain a healthy metabolism, right? If you have a slow metabolism, which has been shown to be present in both Durkheim's disease and lipedema, and Karen Beltran actually showed that on her slides, we want to make sure that yours is, is as healthy as it possibly can be. We want to reduce inflammation. Uh, we, you heard from Emily Eicher about the uh, gut, and you're going to hear more from Lindy Ann Kahn, how to maintain a healthy gut. We want to reduce those leaky vessels that we heard about. We want to improve lymphatic pumping. We want to see what these mucolytics are all about that break up protein in the tissue. And we, I want to talk a little bit about NSAIDs, and I'm going to talk a little bit about pregnancy, because I get that question all the time. I, I've got lipedema. I've got Durkheim's disease. I'm pregnant. What do I do? So this is uh, just a general treatment outline for lipedema and Durkheim's disease, uh, abbreviated DD. And Everyone should eat healthy. We heard that from Emily Eicher. Everyone should move. We heard that from Sonia. Um, we heard about manual lymph drainage. We heard a little bit about wrapping. We definitely heard a lot about compression. Uh, I think you should ha try a pump or have access to a pump. And in terms of medications and supplements, I just want to say that before you start anything, if you have any concerns whatsoever, you should talk to your primary care provider, your nurse practitioner, your PA, your physician so that you know what you're taking and whether it interacts with the medication that um, you're using or if you had an allergic reaction to something, that you're not going to have an allergic reaction to this as well. So the underlying physiology of lipedema and Durkheim's disease includes the leaky vessels. It seems like um, we heard from Dr. Correa that the lymphatics are abnormal even in stage 1 lipedema. So you can have sluggish lymphatic flow, altered lymphatic flow. We've got inflamed and fibrotic fat. So we've got macrophages in the tissue. And after what comes after inflammation? Fibrosis. So fibrosis follows inflammation. And when you, so if you have an inflamed area on your body, pretty soon that's going to be full of scar, scar tissue. And that's going to impede lymphatic flow. We've got these big fat cells that are a marker for a metabolically changed environment. We've got uh, stem cells that are making more fat cells. We've got water in the fat uh, or swelling and heavy tissue that's also got fibrosis. And we've got pain in both lipedema and Durkheim's disease. So in lipedema, there, I too have met some women who have no pain. And so I really mash hard on them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so our goals for treatment are to reduce inflammation. You want to break up the proteins in the interstitium that are holding on to water. And a big glob of tissue is not going to be able to get into that little tiny lymphatic hole that you saw, right? So you've got to break it up, loosen it up so it can slide right out. We want to make the fat cells smaller, and meaning we're making them healthier. We want to reduce the number of fat cells if that's at all possible. That's actually a, a really interesting topic if you read through the literature. We want to reduce the leakage from capillaries, veins, and from the lymphatic vessels themselves. I actually learned from Eva Sevic that um, lymphatics can become very leaky. We want to improve the lymphatic pump, reduce pain, and reduce fibrosis. 
So there's lots and lots of supplements, and you can take supplements in many different ways. So if you don't want to take a tablet or a capsule, you can buy a powder, or you can buy a liquid. Um, you can buy sublingual. You can buy creams that you put on. There's some data that um, lymphatic creams actually work just as well as what's taken orally. For example, horse chestnut seed extract. You're going to go out, you're going to buy the capsule or the pill, and you're going to take it, right? Studies have shown that the gel works just as well, right? So why, why are you taking a pill? Well, the gel is more expensive. Now it's a balancing. Um, also, if you drive things into the tissue, they get in better. So DMSO helps things get into tissue better. Microcurrent helps things get into tissue better. Ultrasound helps things get into tissue better. You also want to know where you're, uh, what part of the plant you're using to get your supplement. So this is just green tea. And if you look at the leaves, there's a lot more bioflavonoids in the leaves than in the root. So make sure when you read the label that you know if you're getting the root of the plant or you're getting the, the leaves. So here's our uh, hypertrophic uh, adipocytes, or, or the big fat cells. And again, these are in both Durkheim's disease and lipedema. They're associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. So these big fat cells have also been found in uh, people who have diabetes and obesity. And um, you can actually see them in published papers in Durkheim's disease and lipedema. It's, it's out there for you to see. And you can see that this uh, large fat cell is making this protein called serum amyloid A. And serum amyloid A has been associated with Alzheimer's, but it's also involved in other things. And in this case, it increases inflammation, increases insulin resistance, and impairs the fat from coming out of the, the arteries and the cell and back to the liver. It also recruits macrophages. So this fits right in with the picture of the big fat cell that Karen Beltran showed surrounded by the macrophages. It also increases a protein that encourages uh, the growth of stem cells to make more fat cells. So we don't like these guys. So how do we make them smaller? So here is, is a fat cell. And on this side, these are things that make the fat cell bigger on this side. And that includes insulin, and it includes glucose or sugar. We heard about um, someone's sugar craving today and fatty acids. So fat, sugar, and insulin all make a fat cell grow. The only thing that makes a fat cell go down is this little receptor here. And that binds to two hormones, epinephrine or glucagon. And we don't work a lot with glucagon. Glucagon is involved in maintaining your sugar levels in the normal range. But epinephrine comes from your sympathetic nervous system. You can also get it from amphetamines. And if you've ever been to my clinic, it's, it's a good chance that we talked about amphetamines. And these include things like dextroamphetamine, Adderall, and Phentermine. And Phentermine is a medication that's used in obesity. It's also a one part of a two-part drug in Qsymia. So I'm going to talk about that later, but just to let you know that amphetamines are one way to bring the, these big fat cells down to a more normal size. The other thing that does it is lemons. Do you believe it? Lemons. So we know that big fat cells, when they're around, they, they compromise cell function. They're associated with inflammation. They also release a lot of fat into the circulation, which can get stuck in your muscle and stuck in your liver. So they're, they're, they're bad cells. We don't like them. So they took these mice, and they fed them a high-fat diet, or they gave them a high-fat diet with lemon polyphenols. And you can see under the lemon there, there's a whole list of the polyphenols that are in the lemon, including things like diazomin and rutin. And diazomin rutins, they're great lymphagogues. They help with lymphatic pumping. They're also great anti-inflammatories. But look at that huge list, just by, from squeezing a lemon and maybe taking a little bit of that peel and putting it into your water. I know if you go see uh, Lindy Ann Kahn in her clinic, she's got lemon water with cucumber. So these mice that ate, took in these lemon polyphenols, they didn't gain as much weight on this high-fat diet. Their cholesterol levels were much better. Their sugar levels were better. They weren't as insulin resistant. So one easy, pretty cheap thing to do is to squeeze a lemon in water every day. And I'm sure you've heard of it. People who drink lemons before they go to bed have better sugar levels in the morning. 
right? And it, it makes you feel better, and it also stimulates your gastrointestinal system. So if you're constipated, lemon. So this is a picture of a cell. Here's the nucleus, and here's the mitochondria hanging out in the cytoplasm. I don't know why this gets bigger, but it does. There you go, <laughs> a close-up. So we want you to improve your mitochondrial health because it gives you energy, and mitochondria break down fat. Mitochondria use B vitamins, magnesium, and coenzyme Q10 to function. So there's a study where they looked at women who had hypertrophic fat cells. So they may have had lipedema, who knows? Um, they were considered to be obese women. And they found that in those hypertrophic fat cells, there were lower levels of coenzyme Q10. So the mitochondria was starved for coenzyme Q10. Also, they've shown that in people People, the more fat they become, the lower levels of coenzyme Q10 are in the fat cells. So it seems to make sense that you might want to supplement with coenzyme Q10. So in order to keep your mitochondria healthy, I would suggest coenzyme Q10 as ubiquinol. Now coenzyme Q10 as a supplement is pretty expensive, and I'm sure you've seen that. If you don't get a very well-absorbed coenzyme Q10, you're just gonna poop it out. So it's, it's money going down the drain. So this is one supplement you want to research really well. Um, there's one um, from Epic for Health. It's called EPIC, and then the number four, and then health. There's another one that Thorne Research has, um, and both of those have been shown to be very well absorbed. But there's more that are out there. Find your supplement um, and make sure you, you see the data showing that it has a good absorption profile. You can also make sure that you're getting the coenzyme Q10 in your body by getting your blood checked. Um, you can also, in, at Emory University, uh, look into the leukocytes to see if the leukocytes, the white blood cells, are actually taking up the coenzyme Q10. So is it not only getting in your blood, but getting in your cells? You want to take a B50 or B100 complex daily. I don't recommend the tablets. The tablets have to sit on the side of your stomach and dissolve, and they can make you nauseous. So I recommend the capsule instead. Um, vitamin C, the recommendations from uh, this paper are 200 milligrams a day. I think 2,000 milligrams a day is, a, is better. Um, some people take 5,000 milligrams a day. The only problem is that it um, can make your bowels loose uh, the more you take. So if you're constipated, drink your lemon and take your vitamin C. Magnesium also helps with constipation, but it also improves mitochondrial function. And the best way to get it would be... What do you think? Through your skin, exactly. So an Epsom salt bath would be great. And people add all sorts of, you can add essential oils in your bath. I would suggest you talk to uh, Linda Ann Kahn about that. Um, some people add um, just all sorts of things, but if you could just take an Epsom salt bath every day or every other day or once a week, whatever you can do to get that magnesium in, be careful, it, it can irritate the gut, which is why it's better to get it through the skin. And uh, the recommendation is no more than 350 milligrams a day in your gut. Some people do take more, but you, you really gotta build up to it. So if you have Durkheim's disease, we're talking 50 milligrams a day and just slowly, slowly work your way up or take that up some salt bath. Okay, thyroid. We've heard quite a bit about thyroid today. There are two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. T3 is the most potent, and guess what? It regulates the formation of new adipocytes, and it regulates the formation of triglycerides in the adipocyte, as well as the breakdown of fat. So the whole process, making new cells, taking up a fat, and releasing fat. If you look at the adipocytes themselves, they have thyroid hormone receptors on the cell. And there are, I, I put a paper up here, you should read it. There are a ton of genes that are regulated by thyroid hormone in terms of the fat cell. And more and more people are working out what other genes are regulated by thyroid hormone. So if you don't have thyroid disease, you should have your provider check your thyroid hormones regularly because um, at least Karen showed that, it was that 25% of people with lipedema and Durkheim's disease have hypothyroidism. So like, like Tina said, if you're feeling punk, you might want to go get your thyroid checked, but a lot of the signs and symptoms of thyroid disease are nonspecific. So if your doctor says, you know, you're doing okay and you've seen the numbers and you feel confident, then there's probably something else going on. If you take biotin for hair and nails, 
which will, does anyone take biotin for hair? Yeah, see? So in the assay for assessing thyroid hormones, they use biotin. So if you take biotin, you can mess up the assay. So make sure that you do not take biotin on the day you go get your thyroid hormone checked. Is it good otherwise? It's good otherwise, yep. There are different kinds of thyroid uh, pills. There's Synthroid there, and General Levothyroxine shown here. Um, it's usually a colored tablet except for the 50 microgram tablet, which is white. There's also Armor Thyroid, which has both T3 and T4, and it's from um, pigs. So this. So it's a natural thyroid hormone for pigs, but people do take this medication, and they, if, if you feel like you need T3, then that's probably the medication for you. But for people who have um, mast cell disease, hypersensitivity to medication, there are a lot of excipient ingredients in generic levothyroxine as well as Synthroid. And I have had um, a lot of ladies who have been unable to take Synthroid and levothyroxine, and I tell you, the other endocrinologists were like, you know, snicker, snicker. You know, the, the, that's, they can take levothyroxine. It, it's just levothyroxine, but it's not. And I sent them to the allergist, and they proved that they were allergic to the ingredients in here. Armor thyroid also has excipient ingredients, so that may not be the best choice if you have multiple medication sensitivities. Probably a better choice would be this um, tyrosint over here. It has gelatin, glycerin, and water. That's it. And I've, had, I've switched my patients over to it, and they did better. Just T4? It's just T4. So if you need the T3, you would have to have that um, added additionally and then deal with the excipient ingredients. If you're happy and you know it, thank you, ma'am. So um, we want to reduce inflammation. We know in lipedema there are a lot of macrophages. We know in Durkheim's disease that interleukin-6 levels are elevated. That's a, a very potent marker of inflammation. So what do you do? Take vitamin D. So if you look um, at all the things that occur when vitamin D is low, it's kind of scary. And Tina Trenfalia suggested that autoimmune disease is the cause for Durkheim's disease. Autoimmune diseases occur at higher levels if your vitamin D is low. So take your vitamin D daily. Um, for example, um, if you look at uh, multiple sclerosis, the incidence of problems in multiple scler sclerosis and the severity of multiple sclerosis gets worse with low vitamin D. So vitamin D is associated with um, immune disorders. It protects bones. It protects from cancers. I couldn't list all the papers on this slide. There are too many that show it, it, it um, helps with cancer. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. So the more fat tissue you have, it sucks up that vitamin D, and you get your blood levels checked, and it's not there. And you're like, I'm taking 5,000 units a day, and it's not enough. That's OK. Take more, because your primary care a provider can check your blood levels and watch you. You definitely want to be well above 30. So 30 is the bottom level of normal. So if you're around you know, 35, 40, 45, 50, that's OK. The upper limit of normal is 100. It's hard to go too high. So make sure you're not like at 31 all the time, because if you forget to take it for a couple of days, you'll probably drop into the low normal range. I also like vitamin D and coconut oil. I, I've tried the soy oil, and it's, it gets rancid. And it gives you a, a, a rancid burp. So coconut oil, not bad. OK. Oh, and 1,000 units of D3 is equal to 25 milligram. So if you're taking 5,000 units a day, it's only 125 milligrams. And if you think of the other supplements uh, that you take, like diazomin, it's 500 to 600 milligrams a day. This, the amount of vitamin D is, is actually really small. So fish oil. So you, your cell membranes are made of fatty acids. And the polar side of the fatty acid sticks, is on the outside, and the nonpolar part of the fatty acid is on the inside. If you eat saturated fat, this is what your membrane looks like. It's all stuck together. Do you think that the receptors can move freely in there? No, they're just like, they're all clogged up. So things aren't moving around as well as they should. If you eat polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, you get a more fluid membrane, and those receptors can move freely and do what they need to do. So you get that from fish oil. You can get it from flax. It's a little bit harder, so I'm just going to talk about fish oil. But if you would prefer flax, you can do it. Um, you can also get 
uh, from krill oil, but it, um, it's also harder to get enough of it. You want to choose an ultra-refined, super-concentrated omega-3 fatty acid. And there's the international fish oil standards. If you look it up, there's the website down here, you want a five-star rating. You don't want mercury in your fish oil. You don't want any kind of pollutants in your fish oil. So they need to have a five-star rating. And then how do you know if you're getting enough? You check your essential fatty acid level. Your primary care provider can order it. It's on all electronic medical records. And you want to make sure that your EPA level is about one-to-one -one with your arachidonic acid level. And arachidonic acid is a very inflammatory fatty acid. EPA is our healthy omega-3 fatty acid. If you're 1 to 2, 1 to 3, you're fine. But most Americans are 1 to 40. 40 arachidonic acid, 1 of EPA. And that's an inflammatory condition. The many benefits of metformin. So I like metformin for Durkheim's disease. Anyone who, or anyone with lipedema who's starting to become insulin resistant. So metformin is a medication for diabetes. It decreases glucose output from the liver. It improves insulin sensitivity. It helps protect against cancer. There are huge NIH trials looking at metformin and breast cancer. It also reduces inflammation, right? And People with type 2 diabetes given metformin live longer than people who don't have diabetes and don't take metformin. So it's an anti-aging drug. So if you're embarrassed that you're on metformin, you can say, well, I'm going to take my anti-aging drug. <laughs> and in people with diabetes, if they took metformin compared to people with diabetes that didn't take metformin, they lived about three years longer if they took metformin. That's pretty impressive. And the usual dose is about one gram twice a day. You have to build up because it causes loose stools and flatulence initially. So, you know, little baby amounts, 250 milligrams with dinner, and then 250 milligrams with breakfast and dinner, and then 500, 500, and 1,000, 1,000. And this is from the Diabetes Prevention Program. And you can see that people who took metformin lost weight. They didn't lose as much weight as with intensive lifestyle, but if you're having trouble exercising, maybe metformin could help reduce some of that fat by improving insulin sensitivity. Polyphenols are anti-inflammatory. There's about 8,000 of them. And I'm going to go over each one of them. <laughs> about 4,000 of them are bioflavonoids. So these are natural occurring flavones or coumarin. You've probably heard of coumarin before. It was actually used to treat lipedema in the past. but um, they. Uh, women got uh, liver failure, and so they stopped using it. But these natural, uh, naturally occurring bioflavonoids are found in uh, citrus fruits and berries primarily, so I'm going to go over a few of them. We've heard about horse chestnut seed extract today. I also mentioned the gel. Um, that, that's definitely a favorite, especially if you have venous disease, because there's hundreds of publications showing that horse chestnut seed extract improves venous disease. Diazomin, also a favorite of mine. It inhibits inflammatory enzymes. Quercetin, if you have itching, if you have any kind of allergies, um, congestion, quercetin is not a bad uh, bioflavonoid to take because of this antihistamine activity that it has. Uh, pycnogenol also has antihistamine activity. Quercetin has also been shown to increase the number of brain and muscle mitochondria. So uh, I should have put this over on the mitochondria page. And then I like seed extracts. So grape seed extract is, is one of them. It decreases oxidative stress or inflammation in fat tissue. It's been shown to decrease inflammation in fat tissue, grape seed extract. And it goes to where it really needs to go to reduce that inflammation, which is kind of cool. But there are many other seed extracts. I know um, some people eat like two apricot seeds a day. There, I know a lot of people who eat flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds and even the avocado seed that you can break open and chop up and put in your smoothie. I think anyone who's come to see me knows I like selenium. A lot of people are taking it. And it's really fun now because people come and they're, they say, I'm on selenium, diazomin, NAC, grape seed extract. I've got a whole body vibration machine. I do MLD and compression. I'm like, OK, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> but selenium is a mineral. And it inhibits these inflammatory enzymes that sit on all of your blood vessels. So we're worried about leaky blood vessels. This is a great anti-inflammatory for blood vessels. And it's been shown to decrease lymphedema in two placebo-controlled trials of head and neck cancer. It improves physical therapy. 
of lymphedema, and it reduces the risk of cellulitis, and it, and it goes on. I mean, it's a really great supplement, in my opinion. The question is, how do you take it? And the supplement itself can cause um, irritation of the gut, really not good for anyone with Durkheim's disease and IBS or, or lipedema and IBS. So I've been having people eat Brazil nuts, and each Brazil nut is 200 micrograms. So if you want to get up to the 600 micrograms a day that you need to take, then you would eat three Brazil nuts. If you get plenty of selenium in your diet, go ahead and take one Brazil nut a day. It seems like that's reasonable to do. Um, it has not been shown to help diabetes. And these are the places in the US where selenium is low. I think the place to live in the US is Iowa. Who's from, somebody, from, yeah, see, I told you. So Iowa is the place to go. We should all move there. But if you get your food from Iowa, then you're getting plenty of selenium. Unfortunately, in Arizona, we're not doing so well. You can also get your blood level of selenium checked. And I've checked some of my ladies, and they end up being high. And I would be very careful with that, because in some studies, which are aren't the best studies in the whole world, but they are concerning. Some people develop diabetes when they took too much selenium. So if you're inflamed, you, you certainly don't want to take too much selenium. <laughs> All right, so health begins in your gut. You're going to hear a lot more about this tomorrow, so I'll be brief. Metformin improves good bacteria in your gut, as does a supplement called berberin. Berberin's a really, really potent antioxidant. I'd be very careful with it. It's also been shown to have some neurotoxicity, um, but I know quite a few people who take it and are doing well with it. Um, also, eating barley. Now, barley has gluten. We heard about that, and it's good to keep your gluten level down, but barley has also been shown to improve your gut bacteria. If you take a proton pump inhibitor, Nexium, Pentoprazole, Omeprazole, any of those, it changes your gut microbiome, and not for the better. So that would be one medication you would want to talk to your doctor about and say, what can I do to get off of this medication? It also um, decreases your bone mineral density, so not great. Famotidine, ranitidine, cimetidine, H2 blockers that people with mast cell disease take also changes your gut bacteria, but the studies aren't as good. So I would say if you had to take something, an H2 blocker would probably be better because it also reduces your histamine levels. Leaky vessels. I mentioned uh, pycnogenol has antihistaminergic activity, so it lowers histamine. Histamine causes vessels to swell and leak. It comes from the bark of a tree known as Pinus panaster. You can get pine bark as a supplement. It's a lot cheaper. But with pycnogenol, they actually standardize the amount of procyanidins in the supplement. So you're actually, you know you're getting what it says on the label, which is good. And interestingly, it, it attaches to collagen in the vessel basement membranes and makes them stronger and less permeable. Seems like a pretty good supplement to take. So it improves endothelial function. It's been shown to improve blood sugar and diabetes as long as you're taking other diabetes medication. And it reduces cramps in athletes. I know a lot of people with muscle cramps, and they say, what do I do? I'm taking magnesium, and I still have these horrible, horrible cramps. This, this might be a supplement for you, and that's actually on the handout. And you can also get the ingredients in pycnogenol from taking other things, like eating peanut skin. Good luck with that. <laughs> but what's kind of interesting is pycnogenol uh, improved skin elasticity. And you know, when the arms start to grow, they, they, they sag down. So the skin is losing elasticity. Pycnogenol has been shown to improve elasticity. So another reason to consider the supplement. Well, what dose do you take? There's lots of studies on pycnogenol. Not many of them have been replicated, so we should be careful. Um, for muscle cramps, it's about 200 milligrams a day, and the tablets come as 100 milligram. So remember, they're pretty expensive, so you're taking two tablets a day. One thing we can do is to help our body be less leaky, because there are genes that regulate leakiness, and this is one of them. It's called the APLN gene, and it makes a compound called apelin. It's secreted by adipocytes, and it reduces blood pressure by causing uh, vasodilation. It causes the formation of new blood vessels. And it also controls fat by enhancing the integrity of blood vessels and lymphatics. So if you're leaky, you're going to grow more fat around the vessel. This particular gene product reduces that. And if you knock out this gene product the, uh, in mice, they get obese. 
And this is a picture of what happens if you knock out the uh, apple and gene, and you can see there's a lot of blue in the tissue leaking out, and this is a normal control. So how do you do that? So if you undertake lifestyle changes like exercise, diet, that reduces your LDL, your low-density lipoprotein, your bad cholesterol, your apelin levels will go up. And if you are on a statin medication, simvastatin, lovastatin, pravastatin, that lowers your LDL, your apelin levels go up. So this is an anti-statins uh, uh, protect against leak. You can also take fish oil. So now fish oil is doing two things. It's an anti-inflammatory and it's increasing apelin expression. And then just exercise in general increases apelin. What decreases apelin levels? Corticosteroids. So you know we say if you have Durkheim's disease, you better not take corticosteroids, right? That's kind of lore. That's, that's a truth. And the reason is because it lowers apelin expression and everything starts to leak. And if everything starts to leak, what do you do? You grow fat. Increasing aldosterone levels also decrease apelin. Aldosterone uh, retains water and sodium in your body, and your doctor can check your aldosterone levels to see if they're elevated. And the medication to treat that is called aldactone or spironolactone. And it's recommended for idiopathic edema. And if you read Dr. Foldy and Foldy's textbook, uh, she says, they say, that many, many women with lipedema have idiopathic edema, meaning we don't know why you have edema, but you do, right? So if you have high aldosterone levels, you could take a medication, and it does help. You saw this leaky lymphatic uh, earlier in the day um, when Dr. Randolph was talking. And in this study, what they also did was here's uh, the amount of leakage. They gave uh, the mice arginine and reduced the leakage down to almost nothing. And then if they blocked arginine, the leakage came back. So arginine helps protect against leakage from lymphatic vessels. So what's the dose of that? If you look in the studies, it's anywhere from one gram a day to 30 grams a day. That's a lot of supplement. The common dosage is two to three grams, three to four times a day. How do you do that? If you buy the powder and you get water bottles and line them up, you can dump in your, your grams of arginine into the three bottles and make sure you drink them one in the morning, one in the middle of the day, and one in the evening. And the arginine's pretty cheap, and you can get it pure with no additives. I mentioned statin medications um, that lower cholesterol. I just wanted to drive home that there are a number of studies showing that they also uh, decrease inflammation and uh, decrease permeability of vessels. On to diazomin. Diazomin's been around for a very long time. It comes from the rind of citrus fruit, hence the squeezing the lemon in your water. It's got all sorts of different names, some of them shown up here, which includes vascularia, which your um, primary care provider can prescribe for you, but your insurance company may not cover. And it manages venous tone by activating those smooth muscle cells that are around the lymphatics and around the veins. So it protects veins, and it also um, causes lymphatics to pump. So it also binds up those reactive oxygen species in the tissue that are doing damage, and it, it disables them and gets them out of there. So it decreases inflammation, improves lymphatic pumping, and improves venous tone. Rutins also uh, decrease the permeability of lymphatic vessels. And it does this by being converted to quercetin. And I've had some ladies from Europe who've come over, and they take an entire package when they're in a flare. So you know when you, you're having a flare and you don't know what to do? If you could keep some rutin on hand, maybe you could just take a, a, a good dose of rutin to see if you could quench that flare down. Lymphagogues. So lymphagogues are substances that help your lymphatics pump. And these are diazomin, which I mentioned, the ruticides, which I mentioned, amphetamines I've mentioned, and butcher's broom. So there are these receptors on, on cells. Here's a cell. Here's a nucleus. These are receptors on the outside. I, I made them cell phones because you're, you're going to talk to different people on your cell phone, on your green cell phone, on your red cell phone, or your blue cell phone. And you're going to do different things depending on who you talk to. So for example, if you talk on the blue cell phone, muscles are going to contract. If you talk on the red one, you're going to inhibit neurotransmitters, or you're going to secrete a hormone like insulin. And if it's the green, you're going to cause your uh, heart muscle to contract and your smooth muscle to relax. 
So with that background, let's talk about uh, adrenergic receptors and amphetamines. So again, here's your adrenergic receptors. Uh, they've shown in studies that if you take a lymphatic and you incubate it with norepinephrine, it pumps a lot better and it pumps a lot more. And in dogs, the same thing. If you give them uh, ad adrenaline, which is another name for, for uh, norepinephrine or epinephrine, it increases lymphatic pumping. Even when they took the blood vessels and they clamped them down as hard as they could, they were trying to see if, if you clamped your blood vessels down, could you still pump your lymphatics? And sure enough, you did. That's how potent amphetamines are. You don't get as much of a response if you have lymphedema, but you'll still get a response. And I've had ladies come out of their, you know, with mild lymphedema come out of their compression on amphetamines. This is a, a picture of a vessel. Here's the inside of the vessel. This is the vessel itself. And you can see the, the purple stain on there. Those are the nerves that are in the lymphatic vessel. This is your thoracic duct, which is right up here where all of your lymphatics uh, from the left side goes in. And this is a, this is a stain uh, for the nerves in the thoracic duct. Same thing in the mesentery. So it's present in all of them. And what amphetamines do is they increase the release of norepinephrine and decrease um, the uptake. They also stimulate the lymphatics to pump, similar to electricity. There are a number of side effects. Some aren't so great, like apprehension, worsening of migraines, but a lot of the side effects include increased alertness, increased initiative, self-confidence, and sociability. Butcher's broom is also known to improve lymphatic pumping, and there are studies to prove it. There are also ladies who have taken terbutaline and combine that with theophylline. This is not a controlled substance. Doctors like this a lot more. They were able to lose weight, but they had to take the terbutaline, which is in the amphetamine family, five times a day. To loosen up the, the clumped protein, um, I use N-acetylcysteine or glyphenosin. It works in some and not in others. And the people it works in are those where they can feel their their uh, clogged lymph, and it's really hard for the MLD therapist to move it out. With these uh, mucolytics, it moves a lot better. Um, Dr. Bartholomew talked about uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories causing swelling, so try to avoid them. The only one that doesn't is ketoprofen, which improves lymphatic pumping. Finally, in pregnancy, uh, pycnogenol has actually been shown to not cause any kind of mutagenic or teratogenic effects in pregnancy, no perinatal toxicity, and no negative effects on fertility. But they do not recommend using it in the first trimester. And in this large database of, of uh, venotonics that were used during pregnancy, hesperidin and diazomin were used the most. But you can see that huge list. And when they looked at outcomes, all, all cause pregnancy loss was lower in the ladies who took the venotonics and their preterm delivery rate was also lower. So they, they all actually seem to provide uh, somewhat of a benefit during pregnancy as long as they're not taken in that first trimester. And according to this, to a study that I read, women in Europe drink barley water and there's a recipe for that on your handout. And finally, do not take, eat MSG. Please do not eat any MSG. It's hidden in your foods as um, a natural natural flavor and other things. But there's a mouse model of obesity where they just inject it with MSG and look how they got mouses. So please avoid. So I'm not going to summarize. You have a handout. Thank you very much. <laughs>